Good morning. How's everyone today? Good. Good. So am I. <laughs> this morning, I'm talking about intellect and intuition. And then I'll also be bringing in ideas and thoughts and considerations about uh, initiates and initiation and straight knowledge and kind of an overall view how all of these points of view seem to gather together, collect together to help us better understanding, understand how it's a goal for us to become intuitive rather than to build upon our intellect. Much of what I'm going to be talking about this morning is resourced from the writings of Helena Rourke and also Agni Yoga. So let me start with a letter, August 12th, quite a while ago, 1934, <laughs> keeping in mind what we are sharing is the ageless wisdom. So the date is not necessarily important, or the year is not necessarily important, but the message. So this is what she said in her letter. Intellect and knowledge acquired through reading were never the main factors in the approach to the source of truth. So I'm going to read that again so you can really think about it. Intellect and knowledge acquired through reading were never the main factors in the approach to the source of truth. <clears throat> so today, in today's world, today's society, today's humanity, we are living primarily in an intellectual society where people are dedicated to the development of their intellect. The majority of people believe that intellect, their intellect, will bring success to them, increase their power, broaden their prosperity, and heighten their position. And this is why their minds are developed through academic studies and through a college education. This is not to deny a college education. It is not to deny that we want to build prosperity and be successful in our life. The, ch the issue is that it's not a goal. It's not our supreme goal. Our supreme goal is to build intuition. So I'll be talking a little bit throughout the, the sharing this morning of why it's so important to strive to build intuition. And repeating again, Helena Rourke said, intellect and knowledge were never the main factors in the approach to the source of truth. So this is what happens, as we've seen, that the intellectuals become politicians. They become lawyers, educators, computer programmers, philosophers, scientists, and physicians. But in fact, rather than approaching the source of truth, the source, this is a key word, you want to underline source or italicize it. As we're learning in the, in the world of editing, we no longer underline, we italicize. So, if we italicize the word source, intellects, rather than approaching the source of truth, are instead developing their lower mind. They're developing their lower mind to such a degree that their heart remains far behind. This causes an imbalance between their heart and mind. I really see this as 
people get older and older and older, the, the petals of their heart begin to droop and then harden. And they substitute their feelings with their intellect or their opinions and prejudices and where their thinking is today. And they're not happy. So this is something to take a look at. If, if that approach, as we get older and older and older, if they're not happy, if such people are not happy, the question is why? And the answer found in the teaching is they must regroup themselves and return to the nature of the heart and begin to unfold the petals of the heart. As the petals of the heart unfold, particularly that eighth and ninth petal of the heart unfold, intuition then becomes their primary approach to the way they see and experience and feel life, which is the approach and the understanding and the experience of wholeness. Helena Rourke, so I'm going back to my notes here, Helena Rourke wrote that intellect, again, has never been the main factor in approaching the source of truth. So what is that source of truth? It is straight knowledge or pure intuition. So that's where the esotericist, that's where our goal and focus must be, is to create an environment in our aura to create an environment in our thinking and connecting our heart and mind in such a way that now we become receptors to straight knowledge. The teaching of Agni Yoga is written from the intuitional plane of consciousness, the intuitional level of consciousness and even higher. Here's a definition of, this is the esoteric definition of intuition. Intuition is the corresponding sense of taste. Intuition is the corresponding sense of taste on the intuitional plane. It is the ability to see every event, every object from the viewpoint of the cosmic whole, from its origin to the culmination, from the seed to the flower to the fruit, in relation to the whole. That's intuition. That's straight knowledge. Intuition understands through enlightenment. Is that not the most beautiful statement? When I'm reading through the letters of Helena Rourke and I came across this, that intuition understands through enlightenment. See, it's not a gut response, or it's not, oh, I have this feeling. That's not intuition. Intuition understands through enlightenment. It is direct knowingness. It is synthetic knowingness or wholeness. <clears throat> Intuition can all be, also be understood as the voice of the heart. See why it's so important not to forget about the heart? In, in the teachings, there is a science to understanding the voice of the heart. It includes all of our senses. It includes virtues to develop. There's a, a huge science behind this four letter statement or four word statement, voice of the heart. As we begin to function and express our life through the voice of the heart, 
that is when straight knowledge is coming through us. Straight knowledge, as explained by Helene Rourke, Helene Rourke is the mother of Agni Yoga. She says, straight knowledge is intuition of an extremely high center. Direct knowledge is intuition of an extremely high quality. Intuition is light itself. Intuition understands through enlightenment. See how that works? Intuition is light itself. Therefore, intuition enlightens us. It is the ability to contact. Intuition is the ability to contact the light center in all life forms. If you want to build a mechanism, an aura, to create a personal environment where you can be a person of straight knowledge, you must begin to meditate. That is the easiest way, the fastest, the most the lightning path to building an aura that is receptive to straight knowledge, meditation. It starts with thinking, then becomes meditation, and then becomes contemplation. So there are stages, concentration, meditation, contemplation. Without an expansion of consciousness, we will depend upon what? Past memories. Isn't that interesting? With, without expansion of consciousness, we will depend on past memories and the interferences of old, outworn ways of thinking. This occurs when we do not have an expansion of consciousness. Helena Rourke says, memory is for the past. Consciousness is for the future. If we want to expand our consciousness, it begins with concentration, meditation, which unfolds to contemplation. Contemplation is advanced meditation. So therefore, we replace memory by consciousness. I remember one of the medi many meditation courses I took from Torquem, and I had just lost my father-in-law. He was a great, great, great man. And, and uh, so in that meditation lesson report, I was writing about the greatness of my father-in-law, and he sent me back. He said, that's just memorable thinking. You're thinking through the concrete mind. This has nothing to do with the higher mind. I was so shocked. But now I understand because I was dwelling in an emotional experience. Even though he was a great man, what I should have done was thinking in the higher mind, considering the legacy that he left so many students. His legacy is still unfolding, and he died about 15 years ago. It's still unfolding. That's where my focus should have been instead of what he was, but what he was giving to humanity. So memory is for the past. Consciousness is for the future. Therefore, we replace memory by consciousness. Then, in our understanding, we must not conclude that this is the only level of understanding, that we haven't reached the exact truth. But only according to that level of consciousness. So once we reach a new level of consciousness, then we must apply that new understanding to our day-to-day -day life 
Otherwise, it becomes an, an abstraction or it becomes distorted in such a way that it's fant fantasy and not reality. So the idea, and this is what meditation is about, that we focus on a seed thought, that seed thought takes us into the higher mind, the higher mind shows us the synth synthesis of the idea behind the seed thought, then we take the synthesis and put it in our day-to-day -day life. When we apply that new level of understanding, mm -hmm. then our consciousness begins to expand even further. And our understanding of truth also expands. To approach this source of truth, we must awaken our mind to soul consciousness. So, for example, the reason I was a little delayed in coming up here this morning, I sort of read a question from one of our uh, webinar participants saying that he understood that Christ will return in the year 2025. Is this so? What does it mean? To me, after all my years of study, it means that humanity is going to have a new awakening. That new awakening may bring a new messenger, a great messenger, an enlightened being called Christ, called the Maitreya, to humanity. If humanity doesn't awaken, we will never recognize an enlightened being. We will not recognize it. So many, many groups in the esoteric community today are preparing themselves as individuals, as a group, for the year 2025. A new level of understanding can be given birth if we are in the stages of preparation. Otherwise, we'll be resistant and we will repel any great messenger. The avatar synthesis, this is another great being that we're being told will either manifest physically in physical form or will begin to overshadow disciples. This tells us if you have a pure instrument, if your aura is organized in such a way that straight knowledge will be expressed through you, then you can be overshadowed by the avatar of synthesis. This is what we have coming up between now and the year 2025. What are we going to do with our immediate lives to prepare for 2025. To approach this source of truth, we must awaken our mind to soul consciousness, then strive to unfold the contents of the chalice, which is in the higher mind. The first step toward approaching the truth is to unfold our lotus. The developing chalice is like a seed. Now this is an answer that I found that has been bugging me for years and years and years, how in the teaching these two uh, images are interchangeable, lotus and chalice. Well, I finally found the answer. The chalice is like a seed and as the chalice grows, it turns into a lotus flower. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Now I get it. As the lotus flower begins to unfold, the human soul travels up on the etheric spine and eventually locates itself in the lotus, the center of the lotus, like a baby in the womb of the solar angel. The three outermost petals of the lotus are called the knowledge petals, which are composed of one knowledge petal, one love petal, and one sacrifice petal. 
all those three petals make up the three outermost petals of the lotus. In this way, knowledge, love, and sacrifice can penetrate into each body of our personality. When the eighth and ninth petals of the lotus are unfolded, it is then we will experience straight knowledge. The eighth and the ninth petal. Once your heart and thinking is purified, then straight knowledge will permeate your heart. The Master M in the Agni Yoga book called Heart, verse 334, M says, Straight knowledge is not a vague intuition, but as a result of spiritual discipline, together with the understanding of the significance of the heart. Let us not shut our heart petals down. Even if we're 90 years old, let us not forget about nurturing and feeding and watering the petals of the heart. In the book Heart, it says, ask a clever man what has most often warned him of danger, safeguarded him against errors and deviations. An honest man will say the heart. He will not name the brain or reason. Only a stupid man, see he's got a sense of humor. <laughs> he a sense. Only a stupid man will rely upon conventionality rationalized by deductions. And that's in the that's same verse, 334. So oftentimes, intellect develops at the expense of the heart and smothers straight knowledge. When the intellect is developed and the heart is ignored, then certain things happen. And as we begin to recognize the the happenings of these situations and events found within a person, now we understand it, and it may be found within ourselves. When the intellect is developed and the heart is ignored, that person becomes separative. That person may be a politician, even a theologian, a financier, a communicator, a philosopher, but in the cultivation of the knowledge of their fields, they begin to create separative thinking. Think of the, the pastors, the rabbis, the Iman Mahdi's, where they're saying, our religion is the only way you're going to get to heaven. This is not straight knowledge. It is not intuition. It's the intellect. When a person has developed the intellect at the expense of the heart, their mind divides. It thinks in terms of mine and yours. I was thinking, as I was reviewing my talk last night about a dear friend who has passed, and we knew one another for years, and she was very instrumental in getting our group off uh, to a good start back in the 80s. And she would always say, you people. It really irritated me. <laughs> How can you say you people when you're part of you people? <laughs> See, it, but that's, that's what the mind does. That's the separatism of thinking of mine and yours. Mine and yours. Separatism eventually builds a wall in the mind, and the person is left with the lower side of their nature and deprived of the higher nature, which is the beauty of the chalice. When this situation occurs, the person gradually becomes negative, angry, hateful, destructive in many ways, and they begin to unconsciously hurt the interests 
of themselves and other people. The next thing that happens when the intellect is developed and the heart is ignored is ego. In developing the intellect at the expense of the heart, we develop an ego. We begin to think that we are the only valuable person in this relationship. If it wasn't for me, they would be nothing. If it wasn't for me, the group would not be existent. They become, they think that they are the only valuable person in the relationship, in the family, in the group, in the country, in the universe, and they start looking at others as inferior beings. Their ego slowly turns into a curse. And life for them either becomes boring or a never-ending path of pleasures to make them forget about their misery. Now, in straight knowledge, we are going to bypass these things. We're going to practice seed thought meditation, well, which will eventually take us to the higher self, into the resonance of the higher self. In that resonance, we begin to take our consciousness from the stage of meditation, from concentration to meditation into contemplation. It is in contemplation that we begin to function within the higher mind and the intuitional mind. This is why meditation and concentration are so important as a discipline. The intuition is the plane of prototypes, of principles, and of energies. It is through contemplation we can work with straight knowledge. Straight knowledge comes from our higher self or from our master. Through straight knowledge, our purified heart says to help that person or to sacrifice something, or to help that family. And you do it because like an arrow, direct information has been given to you. And you listen to it. In straight knowledge, you ask a question and you receive an immediate answer. Egotism is a sickness. It is a cancer-like growth in the aura of a person if you have egotism, it is very difficult to be healed from it. Egotists are all intellect, knowledge, and information, and separative. If you have not cultivated the heart with the mind, you're, what's going to happen, this is so scientific, it's so spiritual, but it's also so very scientific and gives us answers to questions that we can't find the answers to. If the person has not cultivated their heart with their mind, you know what happens? They begin to develop the urge to dominate. So when you see locally or globally individuals, whether it is the head of a family or the head of a nation, who has the urge to dominate and to rule, you're going to find such a person forcing their will on you. As you, we have to recognize these things and not fall under the dominance of such people, and they are so forceful. Their voices are forceful. They'll hold something over you. And this is what we're seeing with corruption in governments today. As you cultivate the intellect over time, you construct a sense of power to control others, to impose yourself on the beliefs and thoughts and opinions of others, and try to bring them under your will. This is when the heart and the mind are not in balance, when the mind has been given rulership over the heart. 
Such people are aggressive. This kind of imbalance spreads like a cancer and dominates others by all ways and means so that it can increase itself. However, as a person increases his intellect and power, do you know what is happening? He's decreasing his true self. Not education, not experience, not talent, but precisely the fire of straight knowledge opens the direct path to Shambhala. Such consciousnesses are like mile markers on the straight road. Disharmony between the intellect and heart will distort, like a crooked mirror, the reflection of great truth. Disharmony between your intellect and your heart will distort the reflection of a great truth. People reflect every great task in their crooked mirrors, and as such, they begin to distort the teaching. Distortion occurs when a person interprets the teaching through their personal desires, glamours, illusions, and personal opinions. So before you become a responsible speaker, lecturer, teacher, or writing of the ageless wisdom, you must be trained by a teacher of the ageless wisdom and engage in certain disciplines in order to balance your heart and mind and purify your consciousness. So what are those disciplines? The first discipline is to engage in a seed thought meditation and then contemplation. And then practice the 12 energies of the heart. The human heart is connected to the cosmic heart. The cosmic heart is the heart of the hierarchy, the global heart. An advanced heart is in contact with the heart of the sun, which is the solar heart. When the heart is purified, it will register things like earthquakes and calamities and disasters. You can sign on to the USGS, I think it is called, where they report, they'll send reports to your email about the earthquakes taking place. If you today can see the map of the planet and all the earthquakes taking place all over the globe, you are going to begin to understand why you are so dissettled. It's very interesting. When the heart is purified, this is, I'm moving on here, when the heart is purified, it will not distort the 12 energies of the heart. So I'll give you the, quickly the list of these 12 energies, which is each energy almost seems like a, a, a combination. So the first energy is the energy of healing. The second energy is serenity and peace. These are energies of the heart, serenity and peace joy and sacrificial service, courage, daring, striving, and patience, energies of the heart, love, unification, inclusiveness, universalism and synthesis, beauty, understanding, timelessness, straight knowledge, and intuition, all energies of the heart. The energy which records events from space is an energy of the heart. The energy which enables us to receive great inspirations and creativity. The energy which transmutes. And the energies of righteousness and compassion. These are the energies of the heart. Another step to cultivate within the heart are 12 virtues, which are group consciousness, humility, service, patience, labor, tolerance, 
spiritual identification, compassion, sympathy, sacrifice, and gratitude. The purification of consciousness and of the teaching is the greatest task of our time. A soul-infused disciple has a flaming heart. Christ said, let your light shine, right? A soul-infused disciple has a flaming heart. As we purify our consciousness, as we unfold our consciousness, as our consciousness becomes higher and more refined, the substance of our mental and lower planes becomes organized and increasingly refined in such a way that we can better express the new light that is striking the substance of our consciousness. It is in the purification process that our light will shine. We will be joyful, not depressed. We will not lie or cheat or hurt others. We will not have bad habits such as smoking pot, marijuana, alcohol, cigarettes, and so forth. When we purify our consciousness, we put a tremendous responsibility on, upon, upon our shoulders. If we purify our consciousness, we will increase the number of flaming hearts in the world. And in this way, when the avatar of synthesis returns, that avatar will know who you are. And you will recognize that avatar through your enlightenment. As Christ said to his disciples when they asked him, how will people know that we are your disciples? He did not say, they will know you by your IQ, <laughs> by your knowledge, by your position, and by your money and your power. He said, people will know that you are my disciples if you demonstrate your love for one another. There are not many flaming hearts in the world yet, but we can continue to strive. And as we unfold the seventh and eighth and ninth petals of the lotus, we will be living a sacrificial life, becoming a flaming heart. Okay, I, I'm, I think I can finish some of this. I said I would, I would talk a little about, bit about initiates, so here it is. There are now many initiates, but it is not so difficult to recognize the imposters. Helena Rourke points out that the imposters lack simplicity. When the true initiates or entrusted ones are entirely simple in their lives, trying not to be different in outward ways and to be silent about their achievements, all the self-deceiving ones are very fond of acting mysteriously as well as using high sounding titles and names although they themselves do not even know what real initiation means. I'm sorry, I can't find the, that resource, but it's from, it might be from her letters, and it probably is. I just don't know which one. Look it up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So who are initiates? Initiates are those who have chosen the path of illumination. Helena Rourke wrote that they do not boast or think of themselves as being superior to others. They are discriminating in their speech. Discriminating means discerning 
in their speech. And they have learned the power of silence. The initiate passes through many difficulties, but does not complain. An initiate does not talk about their initiations, nor do they advertise themselves as an initiate of the mystery tradition. An initiate serves under a dominating ray. And while they broaden their consciousness and expand their field of service, that dominating ray inspires their chalice, their lotus, their consciousness, and they are receiving straight knowledge or that higher, more refined resonance of intuition. The initiate travels the narrow path. The initiate enters into a deeper and higher level of consciousness and awareness as they engage in deeper and more responsible labor. An initiate is group oriented. And this is from the first volume of Helena Rourke's letters in August, August 12, 1934. So what is simplicity? Helena Rourke's dis description of simplicity is reminding us that those on the path of service are pure expressions of humility. They do not draw attention to themselves by being different, by dressing differently, by acting differently, by speaking differently, and developing odd mannerisms. They do not brag about their many achievements and talents. They behave in a most direct and open manner, and they do not present themselves to others in a veil of mystery. They are frank and direct with diplomacy. They stand in the light of reality. In their simplicity, they become a gift to others of increasing light. She also wrote, if you want to know how to apply the teaching of, in life, it is through all simplicity and with all the heart. 